So what would you say if I would tell you that you could leverage the power of your voice to actually stand out in your market and become an authority in your niche? Well, this is exactly what we are going to explore in today's episode of Build Your Thing. I'm Matt Giaro and I'm your host. And on this show, we help content creators find their unique creative voice, monetize their work and build their tribe of loyal fans. And today, since we are talking about how to use voice, I have a very special guest. You probably don't know his name, but you certainly know his voice because he's the voice behind the epic show that you probably watched dozens and dozens of times which is called How It's Made. And the voice behind How It's Made is called Brooks Moore. So Brooks has been in the voiceover industry for over two decades. He also runs his own production business. And in today's episode, he's willing to share one of his best tips and strategies in order to leverage the full power of your voice to really take your relationship with your audience to the next level. I couldn't be more excited to have Brooks on the show. And with that being said, let's get started. All right, Brooks, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's a pleasure. And um, as I told you before, you know, hitting the record button, like I've been a huge fan of uh, the show. And as I told you, like probably everyone is say- saying this to you, but like it's it's really great to to have you here and, and really get your insights because um, I mean, you have been doing this for for decades right now. So, as I mentioned in the intro, in, in the introduction, people probably know your voice, but they don't know who you are. So, if you could give us kind of a quick bio and what you're actually up to right now. Sure. Well, you know, one of the um, things about me is that I don't just do voice. I also direct and produce, and have a production company with my wife that we do a lot of different projects, documentary, feature films corporate work, a little bit of everything. And I started voice work when I was a young person. And I started with horse shows because I grew up on a horse farm. And we went to horse shows and the events require someone at the in gate sending the horses in the ring to announce who is coming into the ring and who is coming up next to go into the ring. So I started with that as a job and people said, hey, you have a nice voice. So then I started announcing and then got into some radio and, and, you know, different narration things for corporate or commercial. And then it kind of uh, took off when I started doing a little bit of work at Discovery Channel. I offered to read what we call a scratch track. And a scratch track is when they would get a show in from another country and they needed to re-narrate the show for the U.S. market. So I did that and, and the producer that heard it liked it. And he said, well, I have someone lined up for this show, but I have a show coming up that I'd like to use you on. So that started the kind of career on broadcast cable so to speak. And about uh, six months to a year later, he said, I have this show that's actually produced in Canada called How It's Made, and I'd like you to be the voice in the U.S. And I said, wow, that sounds great. He said, it's a very simple show, but it does really well. And I started doing the show, and I've been doing it ever since. And it's been a it's been a, a real blast. You know, when I was a kid, I always liked to take things apart. So I'll, I was always very curious about how things work and how they were made. And I would take apart something and then put it back together. And it's just funny that that's the show that I'm doing. So uh, it's been a real treat and a real pleasure to have that job to do how it's made. I mean, it's... Uh it's kind of a kind of a dream story right so like on one side you have like um you know like using your kind of unfair advantage which is like using your voice and on the other side you can just you just combine this with um like may i say a passion of yours which is like understanding how people how how things are are actually working and and you know just try to you know to to see how how things work 
Yeah, it it is. Um, and the other thing I get to do is I get to produce and, and direct things. So I'm a type of person that you would say maybe is attention uh, deprived or deficit or whatever. So I like to do many different things. And I wouldn't like to just be in the audio booth all day, but I do like to do audio. I love it. And I like to uh, be a director of photography and and direct uh, different uh, commercials or television series. We just finished up a shoot in Italy for about four months on the different th- uh, the 33 islands in Italy that are kind of on the outskirts around around Italy. And that was a really awesome adventure as well. So I think that, I guess the tip is being able to listen and being able to describe something that people don't know about. And kind of like Apple computer, you know, they, Steve Jobs would say, I want to make something that people didn't even know they needed. So what I'm trying to do with how it's made is describe something that you didn't even know existed and you didn't even know you had any interest in it. But if I can describe it and visually we can tell it in a way and that can work well together, then it can make an impact on you to, oh, wow, I didn't know that's how a hot dog was made or how uh, a computer chip was made. So that's really the, the fun thing about that show the challenge this is very interesting and and i really want to go back to like the the thing that you mentioned is that seems like you get a little bit like let's say you get bored by doing let's say you know the same thing like all day um and you're and doing it like 365 days per per year so um my question for you is how did you try to manage your different um fields of interest Well, I have a team that I work with at the company that uh, takes on many different roles in managing productions and budgeting and and things like that, which I used to do all those things when the company was much younger. But that really kind of helps me be able to jump into uh, different opportunities. So let's say we're doing a project uh, speaking about COVID vaccine. And, you know, I get a call, hey, can you do this script? And I'm like, okay, you know, so if I, it could be, I mean, what's been really funny is um, one of the things I did for Discovery Channel was when they first launched the Mars Rovers, we did a weekly news break and it was about a four minute news segment, three to four minutes about what was happening on Mars with the Rover. And it was uh, the rover opportunity and discovery. And and uh, I had to do that every week, no matter where I was. And I did not miss an episode in four years. So that meant that when I was on vacation in London or, or Paris or South America, I did the show, whether it was um, on top of Machu Picchu in Lima, in Peru, or, you know, in London. And that's kind of the thing. You have to be available uh, within a certain amount of time when it's needed. Now, that show recorded every Tuesday at a particular time. So, obviously, if I knew my schedule would not allow that, I might ask if it could be arranged to do it, you know, on a different day or maybe a different time that day. And uh, that usually worked out. But, you know, when you commit yourself to doing something, you have to do it. And and I always say you have to do it well. So that meant that maybe that meant, uh, yeah, maybe that meant finding a recording studio in those places to record or, you know, bringing my microphone and a recorder with me and, you know, setting up mattresses or something at the hotel room to make it sound good. So it's always doing it and, and doing your best. Yeah. Uh, I really, I really like that. So like I, I, I used to say, and I really like to say that, you know, like amateurs, you know, they just do the things when when they feel like it while pros like they just make it happen so even though you know like 
you may come up with 500 different excuses, but like when you have to show up, you simply have to show up. And this is why it's so important to actually, you know, have system in place, processes, and, uh, you know, so that you, so that you can actually show up when you need to show up. Yeah. And with enough time, you can usually work that out. Now, if I was, if I was in the middle of directing a project, um, I would try to see, you know, in advance, I would know that. So I would try to say, hey, would you guys mind if I did it that evening? I know we need, it's timely that we need to do it that day, but I have something else going on. Could I do it that evening or whatever? And, and usually they were very accommodating uh, for that. Uh, so it generally worked out very well. But I think one of the things like you just mentioned, and that's the work ethic of doing something and doing it well. And that takes time. And you can't get behind a microphone and just have this natural gift. You might have a gifted voice, but to use your voice takes practice and it generally takes instruction to help you be able to use your voice. So if that's, if that's your thing, if it's directing, same thing, practice and instruction. And sometimes that instruction is watching, but it usually involves a mentor or someone else to help you and give you that chance. So like just driving down the road, okay? I might just kind of uh, in the top of my head, you know, they have, uh, like at a sports game, they generally have a little, uh, sponsor thing at the front, like with the, with the sponsor's name and, and, you know, their tagline. And so like, I'll just, you know, if I'm driving down the road by myself, sometimes I'll just practice saying that and I'll practice saying it in many different ways. Um, so, you know, as an example, um, Chevrolet, it's an automobile, you know, um, uh, and they had a tagline like, um, today's Chevrolet, heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet, right? So I would think about, okay, how can I say that, that would have that impact that the advertiser would like? And it could be as simple as the heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. So if you notice, I adjusted my voice, not to be somebody other than me, because that's not the goal. My goal is not to be this other voice guy. Everyone has a gift. And I tell people that say they're not creative, that's BS, because Everyone has creativity. Everyone has gifts. And I was with someone yesterday who's, you know, great numbers, math whiz, financial whiz, analyzes stocks and bonds all day long. That's what she's paid to do. And she says, I'm not creative. And then she shows me this picture that she had done on the wall. And she had inside the picture frame, she had another picture frame with her picture. And I'm like, wow, that's creative. Don't think just because you're a numbers person that you're not creative. So don't put yourself down. Think about an area that you do have a gift. And if that might be voice work or music or whatever, you're not going to just pick up a guitar, pick up a piano, whatever instrument, and be Elton John or whoever the first time you start. It takes practice. And it takes instruction, whether it's a YouTube video or not. One of the things about the YouTube video and instruction, especially with something like the voice, the person giving you instruction on YouTube can't hear you and be able to give you feedback. And that's a very big deal. So back to that thing I was talking about when I would just kind of practice going down the road and uh, I gave you a read like uh, the heartbeat of America today's Chevrolet and you notice I had a little you can probably tell I had a little bit of a smile in my voice and 
maybe you didn't know that's what that was, but that's what I'm feeling when I'm saying it to, to exude a friendliness to it. Now I could try it another way. The heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. So I used a different register of my voice to say that. And, um, but I still added that little bit of a smile to it so that there's some friendliness to it. And that is practicing and working. And I, I have worked with an amazing coach who works with uh, people in the business and she'll tell me, Brooks, you know, that doesn't sound right. If there's something I do uh, and she'll give me many, many different scripts to try to read and audition, like just do a read. And then she'll tell me, well, I think you were doing this, or I think you're doing that, or maybe that sounded like garbage or you nailed it. So you really need feedback. And when I give people feedback, as I said, I don't try to have them be somebody they're not. Take your natural talent and add to it and perfect it. And maybe you don't have a lot of talent to start with, but that doesn't mean that you can't learn it. I wasn't born with knowing how to uh, give feeling with my voice. I learned that. This is very, very interesting. And there, like, there are so many insights that I can pull like what you, what you just said. So the first obviously is like you talking about, uh, about feedback, right. And like, let me, you know, um, talk about that for a second, because like what we see today is like with the proliferation of information, um, on the internet, especially is that, you know, people think that, you know, they can learn everything just by watching a YouTube video. But like one of the, most important and the crucial parts is not just, you know, going through the information, reading a book, watching a video, reading an article, or, you know, just taking this, taking this class. It's really how about you're going to apply it and, you know, getting feedback from someone who can actually point out the, your blind spots. So what did you miss? Like, what did you do well? What you should, uh, what should you, let's say, um, focus, focus on, and so on and so forth. So, um, like, like uh, I, I really love that. So, the the second part is that, um, what's your take on? Let's say um, people may think that, well, um, my voice may be average. I'm just, you know, an average Joe, and like, should I really work on improving my voice? And and what will be the benefits of actually, you know, working? working on improving my voice? Well, I think a couple things are important, and it depends on your audience. If you're going to have a worldwide audience, then you're going to need to have a, if it's an English speaker, you're going to have to have a, um, not a regional, but a national voice in um dialect, right? So if someone from the north is New York, you know, you can't talk that way because someone from the south is going to say, what is that guy saying? You know, so if you notice a lot of times in, in let's say there's a um, movie you might like, and then there's a behind the scenes with this actor and you realize that English wasn't their native dialect. And, but they nailed the accent because they worked on it. It's not a, um, oh, I'm going to do, you know, a different accent today and I'm going to just do it myself. No, they have a coach that coaches you on dialect. And um, I took a speech course in college where the guy was like, well, let me show you a tip for enunciation. He said, put a cork in your mouth, between your teeth, and try to talk without hitting your lips on the cork. 
And I'll do that before sometimes audio sessions just to, and practice it at other times, just to work on making sure that I enunciate clearly. Because I know I have some words that are difficult for me to say uh, clearly, so I, I need to work on that. I think that if you're looking at YouTube or, or um, Instagram, you know, TikTok, those kind of things, can you be entertained? Yes. Can you maybe entertain someone else? Yes. Can you learn something? You, you sure can if it's something that you don't need feedback on. So I like doing some building work with wood and make furniture and things like that. So, yeah, I can watch a video and I can learn how to do something. And then I can see if it's done well or not based on looking with my eyes. But it's different with your ears. And that's where you need the feedback of someone to help you develop yourself, develop your gift, and develop yourself in a way where when you talk, people are going to listen to what you have to say. And that's a practice that you don't just do in front of a microphone. Think about it when you're talking to someone else. Are you talking in a way that's too fast, that maybe they're not getting half the information you're saying? Um, is it clear what you're saying? Is there a message to what you're saying? And we don't often get that feedback about, well, boy, that, that was really good what you said to me. But sometimes when you get feedback from something that you spoke to someone, words you spoke to someone, about what that meant to them, that's like a feather in your cap that you are speaking in a way that someone's listening to. And that's kind of a mindset. You have to kind of, you know, we, we, our life mostly is on autopilot. And we learn things as we grow up, and we do those things without even thinking. But what if we stopped a second and thought, wow, maybe I could adjust this, and maybe I'd be a better communicator or a better messenger? And that's what I try to help people to realize, that change the script change where, take what's good from what you learned growing up and weed out the wheat from the chaff. But it's always hard to know what to weed out when you aren't aware about it, right? That's correct. It really is. And that's why, you know, I've had help over the years in uh, making getting myself, I've had other people help me to become more self-aware of things that I'm doing that aren't effective. Yeah, because getting this outside perspective, we all have our own paradigms and, you know, we all have our own operating system, right? And, you know, getting obviously outside help from someone who has another operating system and has another view and is wearing other, um, auto spectacles, well, it helps you, you know, uncover your, your blind spot. So like, I really, I really love this lesson right here. So Brooks, like a lot of people who are going to listen to this, to this, um, to, to this episode today, um, they may be thinking about, you know, starting a podcast and uh, truth be told, um, I consider myself more like kind of a writer. So like, I really enjoy writing and um, like I also get a lot of good feedback about, you know, my emails, the articles I write, et cetera, et cetera. But there was like one thing that I was missing in, in my, you know, my global marketing strategy. And it was like, if people only know about you, like 
as a as a writer, well, then you know, building this trust and you know building this kind of a relationship, especially online, right, is tough, right. So this is then when I when I started to really think about okay, so so what could I do? Like I'm a I'm a diehard introvert. I don't like to you know to to be on camera. I've tried this in the past, didn't work out. And I was just thinking, well, why not why not start a podcast? And starting a podcast is, in my opinion, one of the best ways to, first of all, you know, to 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 improve um your content in general, because you know, when you're going to talk about something, then obviously like you're going to uh to you know to 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 really clear your mind about that specific topic that you're that you're talking about but on the other side it also helps you connect with other creators and other people in in your in your niche and even outside your niche right so we're having like a great conversation right now and the thing is that what would you what would you suggest to someone who just you know has been thinking about starting a podcast because i heard you saying on another on another show that um what makes actually a good podcast is is actually the host and and the questions that that he's asking. So I don't know if I if I'm, if I'm on a on a good side or on the bad side, but I would certainly love to to get your take on that. Well, first of all, um, you you have a skill and that's writing. Okay, first of all, you have a skill and that's writing, and and that is um, the story is what things are about. So a good story. Um, trumps anything else because that's where the interest is going to be. And then it's, can you tell that story in an interesting way? The next thing is a podcast host. Can you bring out the story from your subject that you're talking to? And I think the next element is not being so caught up in all of the questions that you had down in advance, but to really listen and focus on what they're saying. And if you find something that you like, take a run with that. It might not have been on your paper, like mm-hmm. you did earlier in this podcast. I said something, it, it caught you. And you were listening to me and you said, you know, I like what you said about that. Can, you know, could you expound on this or let's go back to that element? That's what makes, I think, a good podcast is the story. Being able to tell the story in an interesting way and then being able to get the story from your subject that you're talking to in a in a beautiful way that people can feel comfortable listening to and relating to. That's awesome. So um, you previously tackled um, so- some elements that I would like to go back to. Maybe it's because I'm a little bit selfish. I don't know, but like there are some, like some things that, that you mentioned when it comes to um, uh when it comes to you know like the way you're you're talking the like the fact that you know you need to take some uh, there are some things like do you actually announce things in such a way that people actually can follow follow through etc cetera, etc cetera. so like i have this issue like on my side is that because like there are so many things that are going on in my head i just want to you know to get them out as quickly as possible and then you know, at the end, like I just end up with saying, you know, different things and this may hurt my clarity. So do you have any advice for people who are like in, in my situation? Well, a lot of people have talked to me about meditation and quieting your mind. And I think it's important to try to quiet your mind, whatever technique you might use or learn about. And then the next element is listening to people that are better than you, that you respect, and maybe reaching out to them and talking to them. I, to this day, 
will go to a seminar with a group of people that are handpicked by the coach, that are people working in this business that are professionals, that are better than me. Now, maybe I'm really good at what I do specifically, but they have other areas that they're brilliant with and how they read a movie trailer or something of that sort. So I get to learn from working with other people. The other thing that I always do, and, and I work with my wife, and she's been a big promoter of this, is if we're doing a job and we have in the budget to hire somebody that we can learn from, let's say a bigger director, okay, we'll hire that person. And all of us at the company will learn something from that. So you never want to stop learning. You want to try to quiet your mind so that you can focus and listen. And then if you need to take a pause, that's okay. You don't have to fill up the air with noise. Silence is okay, and you can always edit that out if you want to during your podcast. But it's, and if you need to regroup, hey, do an edit. It's okay. I like that because, like, f first, like, it leads me directly to my next question, with, which was about, you know, filler words. But before that, um, there is like, um, I really wanted to, you know, to, to dig deeper into the concept of editing because like one of the things that I found like may it be like um, let's say a, a video or let's say an online course that I, that I, that I recorded or uh, when it comes to writing or when it comes to even, you know, uh, the podcast right here, like I like editing to a certain point. Um, but you know, like I'm more into side uh, on the on the on the creative side which is like coming up with the ideas um you know getting them out etc cetera, etc cetera. but one of the things that i have been heavily using um in the past years when it comes to being able to create content faster um and you know getting things like ship things quickly is that i always try to avoid the editing step For a simple reason, because like I'm kind of a perfectionist and I know that if I'm going to start editing and edit out everything, then, you know, I'm just going to, to get bogged down by, you know, making things perfect. So I would really like to take your take on that. Well, I would say I love editing and I think you're right. Uh, nothing is ever perfect. And I'll go back and watch a video I did a year ago, and I'm like, hmm, I should have left a little bit more black in between that dip to black from this frame, to, from this scene to that scene. So nothing is perfect, but you are judged based on what you're sending someone. So they always used to say, if the file you're sending someone for them to display is messed up, even if the program was amazing, let's say it was in the wrong compression format or they can't play it back, then really all that work you've done is for nothing. And you've been paid to do this work and the client's not happy because it didn't play back. That simple little thing. So what I try to do is I'll, I will pick my battles. So I'll pick my battles in a way that what can I accept and what can I not accept? So maybe there's a question or maybe there's an answer that, eh, you know, we don't really need that. Okay, quick. Can I chop that out? Great. Do I need to chop out every breath? Uh, you know, before someone speaks? No, not for this. Now, if I was doing an audition for like a 30-second commercial, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a heavy breather 
And I take all that out to make it the best I can make it so that I have a good shot at getting the job. Now, when I do a recording for Discovery Channel, the producer's listening on the line and uh, I'm recording in my booth where I am right now. And then it goes to an audio mixer who cleans it all up and, and does all those things before it's put in the show. So I don't have to worry about them uh, messing up or me putting that effort into it beforehand. I don't need to do that. And it would be a waste of time on my part. And, it, and the person's going to do it anyway. So I think you have to pick your battles and decide what is worth it and what isn't worth it. So I always think from an editor standpoint. Earlier in the show, I repeated myself because my stomach was gurgling and I did a pickup. And I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, he'll probably edit that out. That's why I did a pickup because my stomach was gurgling. And I'm not sure if he heard that. So I always think as an editor, and I think it's good to be able to think about that. Because then if there's a mistake or a problem or a problem with the internet connection on your podcast, you can know what to do quickly to solve the problem. Because just, you know, cutting out a quick section is, is easy. Taking out all the breaths, that's a lot, especially with a long show. So that's something I wouldn't do for a long term piece, but something I would do for a 30 second audition for something. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. So it's really, I think it also goes back to standards, like having specific standards depending on the project that you're working on, right? Yeah, it does. And I think that, um, look, when I go back and listen to something I did when I was in my, when I was 18 years old, I think, wow, I sounded really bad. So I didn't have, I didn't have the experience at that time to do what I do now. I was, uh, attempting to do something without a lot of instruction. I did hire some good people for some different video projects I was doing that were good announcers or good voiceover people or narrators. But boy, when I go back and listen to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, I sounded horrible. So it takes time. And I think what you'll find if you start, don't be ashamed of what you started with when you go back a year later and listen to your progress. Be thankful that, hey, wow, I've really made progress in my delivery, my storytelling, my listening, my being able to do a follow-up question based on what the person said instead of skipping to the next thing on my uh, question and answer paper that I prepared in advance. You'll, you'll see the progress, and I say look at that and feel good about it. Sometimes we have to, when we get a compliment, what I've started doing now is when someone says, hey, Brooks, that was really great. Before, I would just like, oh, it's no big deal. Now, I put my hand on my chest and I say thank you. And I put my hand on my chest so that I make sure I take a second and absorb the compliment. And that's even when you're complimenting yourself like, hey, wow, this is a big improvement over what I did. I'm starting to feel really good about what I'm doing. Or someone just complimented me on my podcast. Don't blow it off because that's your script, as we were talking about before. Feel it. Yeah, that makes uh, that makes so, so much sense. So like, I always like to tell people, if you look back, let's say, at the content you created three months, six months, one year ago, and you're not feeling this kind of feeling that, oh, like I'm ashamed of what I just put out, then you didn't make any progress, right? So it's actually good to have this embarrassment, like, you know, and, and, and just seeing that right now you would do things differently and you would do things better. That's, that's, that's a strong indicator that you are becoming better. But, you know, when you're in the weeds and, you know, just doing your day-to-day -day tasks, you do what you have to do, um, you can't really see the progress. You only see the progress when you look back at, you know, your previous work. And 
I'm glad that you mentioned this because this is really, really important. And I really like your your technique of putting your hand on your on your chest. And yeah, we are we are like especially you know when you're when you're creating content and like especially online, you know, like everyone is is judged. Everyone judges us based on the content that we put out there. Um, yeah, taking some time and just putting your hand on your chest and really, you know, slowing things down <laughs> is actually a, a great way to start appreciating, um, you know, the the compliments in, instead of just focusing on, you know, the the bad things that are that are going on or you know the nasty comments or or and that kind of stuff. That is such a great point. And I started out um, doing voice work, you know, and I didn't have to audition because it was projects. The clients would come to me and I'd say, hey, let me read you a demo. And they would say, yeah, I like your voice. And then when I was doing some work at Discovery Channel, you know, I was in the door and a producer would say, hey, I like you. I'd like you to be the voice for this show. But when I started working outside of that internal realm that was there, the amount of rejection is insane. And you have to say, well, you know, I've been picked for certain things and I don't want to get pigeonholed into a certain thing, but voice is just like Picking a voice is like picking a color. It's like picking a car or the accessories or options that you want or the food you eat. I might like a different type of food than you like. It doesn't make me bad because you didn't choose me. That's the key element. Because you weren't chosen doesn't mean that you're no good. And if you go down that rabbit hole, it's really, really hard to get out of. So I'm of the opinion that you never give up. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't work on improving. I think if you want to be doing something and you want to do it well, you should always seek to learn about your skill and learn how to be better at it. Always, never, till you're dead, you should never stop learning. If you, and don't take it for granted. But if you're in a, if you're in a business where people are choosing you or not, and look, starting a podcast out is really, really hard work to build up that audience. Can it be done? Yes. Are there certain techniques that, are needed to maybe help figuring out the words to tag and that kind of thing to market it? Yeah, sure, there, there are. And maybe that's not your specialty, but it would be important to try to work with someone that is, that can mentor you and help you get to where you want to be. And then the key thing is when you're where you want to be, you help other people and you bring them up too. Because you got to pay back when someone, people in my life have given me chances at different things over the years. And I'll never forget that. And I'll always appreciate it. It wasn't, it wasn't Brooks. It was someone gave me an opportunity to shine and I shined. But if I wasn't given the opportunity, no one would be able to see that I could shine. So that means that's your duty to pay it back to others. And you don't worry about, you know, look, maybe, maybe they get more shows than you. Maybe they have a bigger podcast than you. You don't feel bad about that and say, oh man, that was stupid. I can't believe I helped him. You should feel proud of the fact that you gave someone a leg up and they're doing really well. Don't take it as a negative. Negativity kills. I don't want to add anything because, you know, me adding on, on top of that would be just a waste of time. So um, I want to go back a little bit to one thing you mentioned previously is that silence. Um, you don't need to 
fill up you know silence and i really like that so i told you that on my list i had like this question here is like many many of us and me the first one like use filler words like like i just mentioned it right here really actually you know all these filler words so what's your tip to start avoid using them and um, do you have let's say any anything that you can you know point out to be comfortable with being silent and searching for like the best way to say the idea that that, that you have right now? Yeah, I think one of the best techniques for me is to go back and look or listen to a performance or an interview. Uh, recently, uh, my wife put out a film, a documentary film. It's been entered in a bunch of film festivals, and we had a screening, a private screening for the people that helped support it. And I was the moderator for the question and answer session. So one of the things I did was I went back and listened to that and critiqued myself about how many filler words that I used. And before I started today, I thought to myself, I don't want to use filler words. Now, we always use filler words. Okay. Like, okay. I just said, okay, as a filler word. But the more you can be conscious of it, the less you will use. And it's okay. You don't have to, uh, mm, well, I'm thinking, let's see. You know, you don't have to, we don't have to hear what's in your mind. Right now, I just took a pause to think about what I was going to say. And that's okay. But I don't really realize it until I go back and listen. And then I'm like, wow, boy, I filled with too many mas like, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, like this or that. You got to go back and, and watch what you do. And even though a lot of people don't like to listen to what they sounded like or watch what they do, just put that out of your mind. It's not an ego thing to listen to you and like, oh, that was great. It's what can I do better? So it's really having this feedback loop and having some kind of, um, how could I say that? Some kind of time where you're just reviewing the content that you created, listening to yourself, and then just see, okay, what are, what are the things that, that I don't like? And trying to self-critique, right? It's a lot easier to self-critique when you go back and listen to it. When you're doing it, it's kind of natural to mm. use the fillers. But when you go back and listen to it, you're like, wow, that was way too much. Another thing I think that I just want to say about like what you're doing, and notice I even used a filler word there. What I like about what you're doing is that you are listening to me, you're asking me a question and listening. And many times when we are having a conversation with someone in person, we'll interrupt them. We'll want to make sure we tell our part. Well, hey, you know, this happened to me. And we don't let them finish. And that's critical to a good podcast. I said early on, listening. And listening is letting a person finish even though you might be racing in your mind, I want to tell them about this, I want to tell them about this, or I did this. That's not the important thing. The important thing is, can you draw a story out of them that is going to entertain and be of interest to your listeners? It's not about you. It's about what you can do to communicate them. They are your guest. They are your star. I love it. I just want to end the podcast on these wise words. Brooks, thank you very much for taking the time to jump on a call with me and really sharing your bits of massive knowledge that you've accumulated through all these years. 
Brooks, if people want to know more about what you're currently up to, um, if they want to work with you, what's the best place that they can go? Well, I have a website that I'm updating, but you can go to brooksmore.com. And that's just a website that you can reach out to me. Uh, my email's on there. I get a lot of people, you know, asking me my opinion or, hey, what should I do with this or that? Or I want to do this. So I always try to answer my emails and fan mails because the people that watch and are interested and take the time, I am so grateful that they took the time to write me. And I feel honored by that. And I want to respond to that. So keep up the good work. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And good luck with your podcast. All right. So hope that you've enjoyed this episode with Mr. Brooks Moore. So again, definitely a lot of insights, a lot of gems that you can start implementing in your business today. And well, next time, if you hit the record button, just think about the vibes that you're sending through your microphone. And I guarantee that this will certainly have a positive impact on your content creation and the relationship that you're building with your audience. As usual, I'm going to leave all the links in the description. And if you want to level up your content creation game, be sure also to check out my daily emails. Thank you very much for tuning in today and I see you next week.